Very well said. So moving now to Elia Navi, um, I'm actually paraphrasing in the question a couple of points that you bring in the initial chapter because you said it so well. So I sort of just wanted to paraphrase the way you set it up also. So Elia Navi has become a symbol in Jewish life. According to our tradition, he visits each and every circumcision ceremony. Uh, he's felt at the Seder table and a herald of the Messiah. His biblical persona, however, is rather different. Eliyahu is a zealot, demanding, agitated, passionate, and impatient. In your book, you outline the different approaches as how to understand his fiery persona. Is Eliyahu Navi a mouthpiece for God, or is Eliyahu's actions of his own accord, and dare we even say in protest to God? Why does Eliyahu fall, furthermore, why does Eliyahu fall into despair after the successful display on Har Carmel? And how are we to understand Hashem's cryptic words to try to lift Elio back up. Okay, so it's a, you just asked a huge question. <laughs> so I'm not, I don't know how much I can answer it all. Um, so the way uh, I think we read Eliyahu when we, uh, well, you know, let me even, before I get to Eliyahu, let me say, why did Hashem need to bring in Eliyahu? Hashem needed to bring in Eliyahu because Eliyahu had to fight in Ahab. Um, we look at Ahav and his wife Izebel as a real villain and as uh, you know one of the bad guys of Jewish history and indeed he was but you need to understand that in their time Ahav was phenomenal uh, before Ahav there had been a succession of kings who had been really miserable failures and the kingdom in the north this is the northern kingdom the kingdom of Israel. Um, had been constantly shifting and changing to nations. And suddenly along came a king called Omri, Ahab's father, who built a new capital, Samaria, Shomron. And then he hands off to his son. By the way, Omri himself had been the head of the army. Um, so he knows organization. He's got the popular support. And he hands off to his son, Omri. At this time, the big threat is coming from the north, from Syria, from Damascus. From um, from Aram, and it seems that Omri and then Ahab make an alliance with Phoenicia. And what we know from archaeology and from all sorts of other things is the country became very wealthy and very powerful in this period. And the north, for for, for two generations, have never had it so good. But <laughs> the big downside is that Ahab doesn't care too much about religion, and in his pact. Phoenicia, he marries Izebel, is an ardent religionist, and brings the Baal, lock, stock, and barrel, wholesale, to the north. And as such, you know, the Torah says that if we worship we'll suffer ruin if we worship Avodazara. And suddenly, what do we find? We find that the country's doing Avodazara, and it's more successful than ever. And that is what Eliel Eli comes uh, to fight. He says, Ad ana Stop feeling that you can have the best of all worlds. You can't worship the Baal and still pretend that you are Am Yisrael. You've got to choose. Do you want to follow God or the Baal? You can't be doing both. And Eliel is a very fierce character. He takes the people through a three-year famine on the issue of rain, the Baal is the rain god. Uh, for, and and, and the, the, the assumption was that the rain comes because of the Baal. Eliyahu says, I'm going to show you who brings the rain. It is only Hashem. And for three years, there's no rain. If there's rain, I guess it was sparse. But there's no rain, and he brings the country to its knees until he comes to Harakam, brings fire down from heaven. Hashem, oh Elohim, Hashem, oh Elohim. He wants the people to make a choice and to state it is God and God is the only God. And he succeeds. But he succeeds because of his tenacity. He goes head to head with the king. And I'm sure there are many, many opponents because they were very upset with him because he used such harsh medicine. He brings people to this moment of Hashem or Kim where they actually say, you know, it's, it's all Hashem. And then 
Isabel says, okay, you got, you're a dead man. And Eliyahu seems to have, after three years of holding out, a failure of nurse. Why? Why does he have failure? It's not clear to me. Possibly. He really is a man of clarity. And he says, if I can find out from heaven, everyone will believe. And then he realizes it's more complicated the day after. He's proved it. But reality is much more messy than that. I will remember three days after Kriyat Yamsuf, the people are complaining, where's the water? Uh, 40 days after Harsina, the Kolotu Brakim, the thunder and lightning, the revelation, people are dancing around an Egel. Life is more often than not, not so clear. And even when you prove things and you give people explicit revelation, people have short memories. And maybe representing those 40 days, um, Eliyahu goes to the desert to die. God wakes him up and takes him on a 40-day journey to where? To Har Sinai. And says to him, stop being so extreme, right? Be a bit like Moshe. When Moshe saw the people dancing around Egel, he was very disappointed, but he got on his feet and he defended the people. You aren't to be accusing the people. You're actually meant to be defending the people. And it's that when Eliyahu turns around and says, I am a Zerk, Kanoki native. God says to him, I'm not in the fire, I'm not in the voice, I'm not in the, I'm not in the thunder, I'm not in the earthquake. It's very interesting, by the way, at Har Sinai, there was earthquake, there was thunder, there was lightning. It's almost saying, right? <laughs> I'm using it, I, I, don't, don't try and Har Sinai me, right? I, there's a small, still voice, a cold mama daka. You know, talk with greater compassion. We have to do things slow, whisper. And to that, Eliyahu says, Kano kineti. <laughs> I am a zealot. I don't know any other way. Um, and at that point, Hashem tells him to choose a different prophet, to choose Elisha. Eliyahu is really a man of truth. And, and to a certain degree, and here there are a couple of different directions, but one of the notions that Eliyahu visits our Seder is exactly this. Some people want to say that that's exactly the point. The midnight hour, the midnight hour on when do we invite Eliyahu to our Seder table? After we've eaten the Afikoman. The Afikoman represents the Korban Pesach. You meant to eat it by midnight. So when do we open the door for Elijah? A, sec a few minutes after midnight. What was the midnight hour on the night? We're just coming out to Pesach, right? What's the midnight hour on the night of the 15th of Nisan? It was the moment of truth. It was the moment where God killed evil and redeemed the good. And the moment it's exactly an Eliyahu moment. <laughs> it's uh -huh. Eliyahu moment where the tzaddikim are saved and the rasha'im are zapped. Eliyahu moments like that. We open the, uh, the door for Eliyahu and say, you know what, maybe the gula will be now. Maybe now you can make it as clear as it was then. Maybe now the, the gulut can end and evildoers right, can, can be their comeuppance and the, the 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 good people can be rewarded and that's one of the interpretations of why we open the door for Eliyahu on the night of, of Pesach because to a certain degree that midnight hour on the 15th of Nisan the moment of the exodus was indeed a typical Eliyahu moment where maybe fire didn't come from down from heaven but Makat B'chorod is sort of like that the Mashchit comes to to destroy on the other hand <laughs> There is a different tradition, which is that, remember God was trying to teach Eliyahu a lesson and said, you know, change your technique. You've been a zealot long enough. Now's the time to talk softly. And that Eliyahu, in fact, said, I'm a zealot and the people have abrogated your covenant, right? He has vubrit kabane Israel, he says, because it's here in chapter 19, verse uh, 10. They've abandoned your covenant. And the Midrash says, Abandon my covenant? What are you talking about? The Jewish people, they're not perfect, but they keep my covenant. You know what, Eliyahu? I've got a great idea for you. Go and visit every Brit Milah. You're going to see the Jewish people do keep the covenant. And since then, every Brit Milah, think how busy Eliyahu is every single day, right? Going from continent to continent, visiting every Brit Milah. He comes to the Seder, where again, the two practices, which so many Jews around the world do, 
they give a circumcision to their sons and they have a Seder table. And these are both covenantal moments. The Seder is a fulfillment of the covenant of Ibn Abitarim. And yeah, talking about they abandoned the covenant. You're far too extreme, says God. And in that reading, we don't embrace the zealous, yeah. uh, dichotomous, binary Eliyahu, who only sees things in black and white. We say, oh, a little more nuance, you know, a little more, be a little more charitable. The Jewish people are more complicated than that, right? It's difficult to fight the Baal. Uh, it's difficult to face other cultures. We understand you under, you've got it right, but take other people more time, right? And maybe maybe that's a different different voice. Maybe it's even the voice of Aaron or Hev Shalom or Dev Shalom, the Aaron who was actually involved in building Egel, but eventually became the Kohen. No. So, you know, we hear different voices here. You know, what, what's interesting is that the three years of famine, the people that most got affected were just the innocent people. Uh, Ach, the, the message is for Achav, but the people who are paying the price are really everyone. Right, the woman with her son. As an that. example, yes. Um, which is interesting. So it's sort of like everyone is kind of paying the price for him to give that message to Achav, no? Uh, I, I, think you're, I think you're right. Um, and, and it's a big question in general, you know, especially when you come from the lens of, of the Book of Kings. If the kings are to blame, then why do the people suffer so much? You know, so King Menashe made a mistake or King Sikyao, the people have to go into Galuti. They all have to suffer, right? So, you know, I... I Again, I, I come back and say, and, and I, I often my students raise this question, and I, I, it's difficult to answer, but I will say that that is the way of the world. You know, that's, that's what it means. People get the leaders they deserve, or, or maybe not, but you know, leaders take nations into certain directions, and the whole nation pay the price. Right? A president decides that America should join the First World War, the Second World War, or go to Vietnam, or, or go to Afghanistan, and Many thousands of soldiers die as the result of the decision of the command. And, you know, it, it, it's also true in terms of the economic policies where, uh, you know, the, 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 the government will make an economic decision which can affect the, you know, life and death, the health, the uh, prosperity of, 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 of millions of people. Leaders have great uh, impact. We celebrate them when they make the right decisions. You know, the, the, the Tanakh, the Tanakh is a fascinating book because it is the it is the most counter it is the most subversive book you could ever imagine, right? No king would I want well, to say to my students that um, the proof of the Tanakh is that the, no king would ever let it get, a book like this get published. You think the kings of Yehuda, the kings of of Israel would they would have sent this book? It, it's the most uh, subversive book and it actually leads me to think this must be true right in other words we're actually not seeing the kingly histories the royal histories the the divrei amin l'malchei yehuda or divrei amin l'malchei israel but we're hearing a very religious crit critique a a Sometimes the people too. Amos criticizes the people more than he criticizes the king. Uh, Yirmiyahu criticizes both the people and the leadership. So, uh, you know, different different uh, Navi'im have different styles, but Malachim certainly focuses on the leaders. Beautiful. Wanted to also follow through with a couple mm. of points afterwards. One, um, after Elionavi sort of fails to internalize um, Hashem's message of called Mama Daka, uh, that leads Hashem to essentially um, retire him as a prophet. And he instructs him to go to Elisha and basically become a protege and kind of uh, train him into becoming a prophet. Um, you make a fascinating observation about that initial encounter of how we see a little bit um, through certain actions that Elisha does right when he first meets Eliyahu, um, 
we see a little bit of, uh, of that difference of character, which might explain also how, uh, why Hashem wanted Elisha to take over for Eliyahu. Uh, we also wanted to get your thoughts of Eliyahu going up in the whirlwind, of course, um, your take on that. And um, yep, take it away. So, um, so let me relate to that a little bit. First of all, of course, we get to know Elisha far more um, in the book of Malachim Bet. And whereas Eliyahu is frequently depicted as a loner, a sort of a person who seems to be alone, even though later we find that he does have a na'ar, he has an assistant, but we never hear about that. And Eli Elisha is frequently with groups of prophets. Um, he's, he's, he's has good relationships with the king, with royalty. Elisha lives in the capital city in, in, in uh, Shomron. So Elisha is a much more congenial person. He's always helping people. Eliyahu is, is really a loner. And there's this wonderful scene, which I think you're referring to in chapter 19, where Elish, Eliyahu comes to sort of discover Elisha. In fact, it's clear he doesn't know who he is because God has to say, Elisha ben Shafat me abel mechola. Right? Yes, tell him his name is his family and his location. And Eliyahu goes to find him. Uh, it seems like Avel Mechola is a place in the Jordan Valley. And he finds him uh, plowing with 12 pairs of oxen. Now, to plow with 24 oxen, you've got to be a very wealthy family. <laughs> and uh, it, it's also very harsh, harsh soil there, but whichever way. And this is Elisha's family. Eliyahu simply swings his cloak over him, his aderet, and Elisha runs after him, almost as if he's being transformed. And Elisha has this mesmerize, uh, sorry, Eliyahu has this mesmerizing effect on people. Elisha just runs after him, and then it's almost like he stops him. He says, wait, I didn't say goodbye to mom and dad. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't allow me to kiss my mother and father goodbye? And Eliyahu says to him, oh, what did I do? And at that moment, Elisha goes back, but he doesn't just go and kiss his mother and dad goodbye. He, in fact, goes and takes two of the oxen and takes all of the, uh, you know, tools of, of, of threshing. And he and makes a big kiddush, a barbecue, in fact, for the whole farm. To take two oxen, that means you've got a lot of people eating. And, you know, this must take hours. I always imagine Eliyahu standing there, you know, by the yellow gate of Shadmot Mecholah or something like that, at the bus stop, right? Thinking, looking at his watch, where is he? It's been an hour, it's been two hours, how long? You know, he's, he's already had a cup of coffee with his mom and his dad, you know, what's going on? Meanwhile, Elisha is making a, a, a sudat mitzvah, today I become a prophet. And we gain the sense that Elisha really has a human touch, um, where Eliyahu doesn't. A, a great another way that you see that is when Eliyahu is about to die, um, Eliyahu passes through Jericho, and the people of Jericho don't even talk to him. But later, after Eliyahu is dead and Elisha comes back there, the people say, Elisha, we need some help. Our, our spring is not, it's causing disease. And you like, say, one second, Elisha's the student, Eliyahu was the master. Why didn't you ask Eliyahu when he was in town? And the answer is, Eliyahu is unapproachable. Eliyahu is too intimidating. Eliyahu is, he's just scary. Whereas Elisha, you can ask him for a favor. You can say, hey, Elisha, come look at our spring. It seems to be spreading disease, and Elisha fixes it. So we really got this image of Elisha as a much more congenial um, person who's approachable, whereas Eliyahu has this intimidating side to him. And in fact, that's one of the interpretations. You asked before about Eliyahu going up in a whirlwind to heaven, and there is certainly something almost angel-like, not of this world, in that scene. Maybe let me mention in that way two, two readings. One reading is a very harsh reading of the Abramanel. The Abramanel says that Eliyahu was burnt in fire because that was the only thing to do with him. He was a man of fire. And he says, and in fact, he uses really strong language, the Abramanel. He says, Eliyahu hated the people and he hated the land. Wow. <laughs> uh, which is like uh, shocking. And he said, and therefore God took him out of the land and burnt him, incinerated him, because he went back to the fire, which was the thing that he loved more than anything else. In other words, Eliyahu was this fiery character, and 
he always couldn't spring himself to accommodate himself to the foibles and errors of ordinary people. He saw the truth so strongly, he almost couldn't accept what the people were. So that's one aspect of, of, of what happened with, with uh, Eliyahu. But I, maybe I'll say a nicer, a nicer aspect. Um, there's a scene when Eliyahu is about to go to his death, and Elisha and Eliyahu walk together, and they cross the Jordan, go to Transjordan. That's where Eliyahu goes to heaven. So there's this image of the two of them by El Chushnehem. And Eliyahu keeps on saying to Elisha, leave me, stay back. And he says, no, no, I'm not going to leave you. And I want to relate to two possible images. One, of course, is the image of Rut HaMoaviyah. This is the road, the highway connecting Moab and Eretz Israel. And we always see a sense that Elisha won't leave Eliyahu, just like Rut would not leave um, Naomi. And in fact, even there in Rut, we have a similar phrase of, um, of course, we're looking for the phrase, but um, second, I'll see if I can, can find the, the exact phrase. And in our chapter, chapter two of Malachim Bet, so first of all, there's the sense of dedication that Elisha has to Eliyahu, despite the dissonance between them. And this brings me to the second intertextual comparison, which is we rarely have this image of a master handing off to a protege. But what it reminds us of, because it happens in the same location in the Transjordan, is Moshe and Yoshua. Right? Moshe is the formidable Ish Elohim, just like Eliyahu, who we also don't know where he's buried, right? Eliyahu doesn't quite die. He sort of dies in a mysterious way. And then they hand over to their worldly student who has been very dedicated to them, Yoshua, who's much more you know, grounded, if you understand what I mean. And also Elisha is much more grounded. And maybe this speaks to a certain need, right? You know, one of the peculiar things about Sefer Malachim I said before is Malachim is a book um, about kings. So why do we have eight chapters about Eliyahu and then almost the same number of chapters about Elisha? They're about prophets, not about kings. And maybe this might be there because if we're saying that the whole book is to say what went wrong, how did we get into this mess after the Korban, the people are going to turn around and say, God, you didn't warn us. But you didn't, you know, sometimes you, know, you get in trouble in school and the teacher said, well, you didn't tell us, right? Or you tell your parents, right? If you would have told me, then I wouldn't have done it, right? which obviously is not usually true. But my point here is maybe the pro prophetic chapters here in Malachim are there to tell us this. And I can bring textual proofs of this, but I'll leave it for now. God says, I sent you, Nevi'im. In fact, I sent you two completely different Nevi'im. If you needed a Navi who was fiery and scary and black and white, I gave you Eliyahu. If you needed a Navi who was a little more congenial and worked with the people and helped you and did miracles, I gave you Elisha. And they both were there in order to bring the word of God. And you still didn't listen? You've got no excuses, <laughs> right? You've got no excuses. I sent you an Eliyahu and I sent you an Elisha. Such different people, right? And you still didn't shape up? Then what do you want me to do with you? So it could well be that these long segments about these prophets who actually particularly function in the north more than in the south are indeed there at the very epicenter of the book so that people can say very nice for all the kings, but you didn't tell us, you didn't, you didn't warn us enough. And I think the stories of Eliyahu and Elisha come to answer that. Thank you. Wow. Amazing. And before we go, um, can you tell our listeners where we can find you and if you have any upcoming books because we have these two books kings and um this over here that Bensi's holding up it's hard, trying to, to, get the, yeah, it's hard to see on yeah. the, with the blurred background but it's kings one and two um do you have any other books coming out and do you have like a, a website that people could find you on a channel so i have uh, my website www.alexisrael.org that's pretty easy to find and you can actually find a link there to some of my videos. 
I have at least three four shiurim on every parsha, and I also have something called the parsha discussion, which is short. In rather than the Torah at the table, the idea is to stimulate discussions, teenage discussions, or discussions with the people around your table. Um, you can actually on my website sign up for the parsha email, which always is more in-depth shiurim, parsha discussions, and podcasts. So I always, you know, do that, put that, send that out every week. So please feel free to sign up. As regards to future books, it's a really great question. I have two books in the pipeline. I just haven't had really, I teach quite a lot, haven't had time to dedicate to the manuscripts. One is I want to publish my Parsha discussions. I've got three on every Parsha, and I think it'll be a great resource for youth groups, for camps, for uh, parents with children, teens, and what have you. So I, I actually, Corinne Publishers have agreed to publish it. We just have to get the funding and I have to give them the, I have to give them the manuscript. So back to the pipeline. And uh, I would like to publish some stuff on the Chagim. Um, I'm actually, maybe, you know, maybe my first thing on the Chagim will actually be something on uh, Pesach, as we're coming up to Pesach. I realized I've got so much material about Pesach, either a Haggadah or maybe something sort of a semi-Hagada, right? Um, which were, so those are things in the pipeline. I do a lot of teaching and always uh, happy for people to invite me in person. Um, I'm going to be actually the last Shabbat in April. I'm going to be in New Rochelle. I'm doing a Shabbat sometime in June, one in Chicago and one in the five towns. So I get around and also been doing some teaching for different uh, organizations. One is Torah in Motion, which is a Toronto-based organization, where I've been just actually teaching the Eliyahu stories there. I did a series of nine classes on Eliyahu. They usually put things up on YouTube, so you might find them up on YouTube soon. Um, so that's that's what I've been doing, right? Before that, for Torah in Motion, I actually did a series on seven-part series on the writings of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who I was very fortunate to have learnt with and got to know on a personal basis. In fact, very fortunately, he wrote the recommendation on my first book. And when, when I published my second book, he always used to see me and he used to say, Alex, when's your Malachim Bet coming out? You know, I gave you a recommendation for Malachim Al. Where's Malachim Bet? There was no small amount of pressure. So when I when I actually published Malachim Bet, I wrote to his office and I said, you know, I'm sending you a book in the mail. You've got to give it to him. He's been nagging me about it. So um, his secretary said, that, not secretary, his chief executive said to me, she said, you're not sending a book in the mail. You're coming to London to give it to him. What are you talking about? This is Rabbi Sachs. So I actually traveled to London, like found an excuse. And I went to London to visit Rabbi Sachs. Um, I had half an hour with him. And um, it was a lovely, lovely half an hour. It's actually amazing because I had came with a whole list of questions as always and he answered them. A couple of my questions he didn't like. And then there was a bit of a dead silence in the conversation. And he says to me, Alex, what can you teach me? And I was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, no, there must be something that you're you know, a teacher that I don't know about, a movement that I don't know. What's happening in Israel that I don't know? And I mentioned something, and I mentioned a, a, a rav and a book. And then very next day, his office was in touch with me. What's the book? What's the this? What's the that? And the truth is, that was a year before he passed away. And it was the last time I had a chance to actually, because then there was COVID. And that was actually the last chance I had to visit him and to talk to him. So it was actually, I was so, in retrospect, so happy that his office has insisted that I came and personally brought in the book because not only did I actually manage to, you know, say thank you for his encouragement, but also it was the last time I managed to actually have a conversation with him. And it was a very valuable conversation at that. Amazing. amazing. I'm very, very grateful and glad for that. What an honor to meet him. He, he's like uh, one of our heroes. So. Yeah, we, we literally dedicate our podcast to Rabbi Sachs. When we first started it, we, you know, we, we dedicated this entire program to him. It changed our lives. I was very, I was very, you know, it changed my life too. And I was very fortunate that, you know, I was a student in London just before we became chief rabbi. And he's, we, we, we were able to develop a kesher. And 
he was so encouraging to me, always, uh, you know, told me that, you know, I could go far and I could, uh, you know, do stuff in the Jewish world. And I always say about him that, you know, I'm not sure that I believed in myself, but he believed in me so much that I had to believe in myself. And he had this amazing, uh, empowering presence uh, and took everyone seriously, whatever age. And it was really, it, it, he changed my life, that's for sure. Beautiful. Amazing. Wow. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the time, incredible perspectives. And we hope to do this again one day. Bezrat Hashem, we should do it again. When I'm in New York, we can get together in person. That would be nice. That would be unbelievable. That would be fantastic. And maybe Bizarre Trim, we could do a podcast on the Pesach Seder. If that's the next book that will be coming out, we can we can maybe have you on to go through that, maybe. Let's see. Okay, great. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you for giving me this wonderful opportunity. And I want to thank all of our listeners for uh for you know for listening. And uh, you know, as I say, I, I'm here, just uh look me up online and uh if you ever have questions or whatever it might be i try and read myself open to whoever it is that's something else that i learned from rabbi Sachs. and uh you know, just be in touch thank you thank you very thank much you very much